just want to welcome everybody to the sixth annual MedTech Vision Conference. Sold out yet again this year in the fastest we've sold it out ever. So thank you all for supporting and getting in quickly to register. <laughs> uh, my name is Amy Belramundo, and uh, I'm responsible for the initial I am so pissed off that there aren't more women on the podium email that sparked MedTech Women. Uh, clearly, it takes an entire village to actually pull this off. Uh, but I do like to take credit for that first email that I sent in the, uh, as I was sitting in a conference thinking, why aren't there more women up there? Um, so this year, um, I'd like to show that I am no longer five months pregnant. Uh, last year, I was at about five months, and it's right at that point where it's the awkward, is she pregnant? or she just let herself go after she got married. Uh, so I now have an eight month old uh, and, yay. Yay. Um, and the level of discourse in my house has descended to a level that I think many of you might appreciate, uh, but I thought I would share it with you, what my life has been like for the last uh, eight months. And if we could cue the video. <laughs> Super proud of herself. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, so, as you can imagine, and many of you can imagine quite uh, close to your hearts, uh, my life has been quite busy over the last eight months. Um, so I'd particularly like to thank the organizing committee this year for really stepping up and taking on all of the things, um, and specifically calling out Leslie Oley and Bridget Hurley, who are in charge of program management, which loosely translates into making sure everything gets done. Um, and if that requires multiple emails to me and others, then that is what is gonna have to happen, or a text message, an email, a phone call, and a knock on the door. Um, so again, I appreciate that very much. Um, so on to this year's theme. Uh, so this year's theme is about the opportunity to serve global needs with medical technology. Um, and in years past, we have actually tried to include the global voice into the discussion, but it's actually never been able to do it justice because given you know, how vast and distinct each global area is, you know, having it as sort of a, you know, one comment or one panelist within a panel just didn't, didn't really bring out all the, all the nuance and all the distinction that we needed to. And so this year, we just decided to have a whole conference about it. Um, and even then, you know, we're not gonna do full justice to it, but at least spark the beginning of a conversation and get some insights and identify some experts that can help us go forward with it. Um, at the very beginning of my career, I actually got the opportunity uh, to see actually what a small difference can make, um, and never mind some of the large differences you're gonna hear from a lot of the panelists in the keynote later today. Uh, I actually worked as management consultant to hospital systems, and my first project was in Toronto, which is a, a wonderful city um, with a single payer system, uh, and that actually wasn't even the biggest issue. Um, I was coming from the US, where we were getting paid, and it was actually a relatively new, the DRG system for Medicare was relatively new. And so lump sum payments by patient type. And so the big push in the US was reduce the length of stay. Like get patients out sooner, because that's gonna reduce cost of the hospital, et cetera. Uh, this, the hospital I was working for actually was on an annual budget system. And so they just got a budget from the government to pay for everything for the year. Well, you start reducing length of stay, you actually jack up all the costs in the hospital <laughs> over the year. And so consultants aren't tend to be paid to make your clients lose money. So we had to vastly change what our approach was. And that was actually a very small difference between what we think of as the US healthcare system and the Canadian healthcare system. So the idea that when we uh, think about 
globalization and taking our technologies elsewhere in the world, it's not as simple as we're gonna slap on a new label with a different language. Although I also know that that is actually quite difficult. Uh, <laughs> I've actually had an IFU not pass sterilization because it was too thick because there were too many languages. So that in and of itself is you know, its own challenge. Um, but the immensity of what is different uh, across the globe is really important to both understand and then adjust to. And that's really what the point of this conference is about, is to understand all the different angles of what's different and how we might do things differently, whether it's from an investment perspective, from an R&D perspective, from a clinical or commercialization perspective. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, uh, I've actually had the opportunity to work in a lot of different countries and a lot of different geographies. Uh, most of the time, it's resulted in very funny stories about doing a launch meeting in Hong Kong Disneyland where character dinner and Mickey, Kay, and I was like, what am I doing? I actually literally flew around the world and ended up with Mickey Mouse. <laughs> What's happening here? Um, or spending three days in Brussels in the same jeans and sweater because my luggage got lost on the way on an integration meeting, we got acquired. And there's a lot of different ways you can wear a sweater, as it turns <laughs> out. Like I had it on, then I had it around my neck, then I had it around my waist, and I had it sort of on the side. <laughs> They, no one was fooled, by the way, at all <laughs> by that. Um, and then my epic uh, Shanghai airport, I went through customs, I think, four different times trying to get out of the, <laughs> of the country. And it didn't really work out. I eventually got back, but uh, only because United took pity on me. Um, but what you're going to hear from the experts here is the actual systems, the things that are fundamentally different. Um, outside of the United States. And you know, things like payment systems are different, whether it be a single payer in a government or the amount of self-pay from an from a individual. Regulatory systems are obviously quite different. Uh, infrastructure, um, and I think you're gonna hear a lot of that. I mean, hospitals, clinics, outpatient, but even electricity. Uh, I mean, we take a lot of things for granted here that aren't obvious and aren't everywhere. Um, and so really thinking about how those things impact what we do and how we do them. Um, access and availability and training of specialists. That also is not always available. And so how do we think about our technologies so that they are utilized by folks that may not have the access to the, the, the specialists that we have in the United States. Um, and the healthcare needs are different. And it could be because the baseline of care is different. It could be because the incidence and prevalence of disease is different. Um, and then the expectations are different. Um, and so taking into account all of those aspects, um, as well as post-care support. Um, so you know, I think that, again, we have learned the lesson, I think, uh, in the medtech industry that you can't just de-feature a technology and offer it a lower price point and call that a global product. And so what is it that we need to do differently uh, that makes it relevant and useful uh, outside the United States? And that's really you know, what we've drawn together here and hope to at least start the conversation at a more detailed level, identify who the experts are, in order to just give the motivation to push harder to find what the, the answer to the question is. Um, so with that, uh, I will go through the housekeeping. <laughs> the first um, and really important one is to thank our sponsors. Um, because again, I mentioned it last night, this isn't possible without them. Uh, and it feels like a very special day to be able to spend together in this wonderful environment to really exchange ideas. Um, and that's really possible with our sponsors. Uh, so uh, starting with our diamond sponsor is Medtronic again this year. So I'd like to thank them. <laughs> our Sapphire sponsor is Edward Life Sciences, who is again back this year. Um, they are also sponsoring local events down in Southern California, which we appreciate greatly as well. Um, our gold sponsors are Fitch and Richard Fish and Richardson, uh, who is actually one of our sponsors who's been here with us for all six years. So, <laughs> Abbott is another sponsor who's been with us multiple years. <laughs> Two of our new sponsors, Stryker. and Wisecom Group. I'd like to thank both of them for coming into the fold this year. Uh, another return sponsor is Venable from our silver level. 
in Kilpatrick Townsend in Stockton. Again, a return sponsor. And then our bronze sponsors, BioQuest. Lazar Partners. Avamed, a new sponsor this year. Sprig Consulting, who is also our creative agency. So if you like the look, talk to Sprig. <laughs> and Silicon Valley Bank is our wine sponsor, which is Deb's favorite sponsor. <laughs> So more about that in the afternoon. Um, so then logistics, Wi-Fi and mobile app instructions. I'm gonna read this. <laughs> we do have Wi-Fi available. Um, so the information about Wi-Fi and app access are in the program book. Um, so we, the app is usable by laptop, smartphone, and tablet. Um, it can be downloaded in the iPhone App Store and Google Play Store. Um, and we encourage you to use the app for Q&A. Um, and I have to say, we instituted the app about three years ago, and it's really been a wonderful way to continue the dialogue, so I really encourage you to use it. Um, it also gives you access to who else is here. Um, so I think that's also something new this year so that we can ease, more easily network, because I think that's one of the things that has been brought up time and time again. We really want people to be able to get to know each other and work together going forward. Um, we also have a formal survey, um, which is in the mobile app, so I, I, I use the mobile app. Um, and to get the networking started, we actually would like to start with a meet and greet at your table. So I know this starts chaos, um, so I appreciate once you've done the meet and greet to go and sit back down uh, when I ask you to, but please stand up and introduce yourselves to your table. If I could ask you to s wrap up the uh, meet and greet and yeah. sit back down, that would be lovely. Last clinking is getting more adamant. <laughs> All right, one last logistical thing. If you're struggling with the app, we have laminated cards on each of the tables that look like this. 
uh, to facilitate downloading and use of the app. So thank you, Leslie and Bridget. <laughs> and Stephanie. And Ann. <laughs> Bridget just handed me the card, so I gave her credit for it. Um, all right, so uh, there is one need uh, that is universal, and that is the need to respect and care for the patient. And we have begun every MedTech Vision Conference with a keynote from a patient and representing the patient, and it's to focus us on why we do what we do uh, and really start the conversation there. Um, so I'd like to introduce Virginia Giddings, who is a co-founder of MedTech Women and head of advanced technology and innovation at Stryker Neurovascular, who will introduce our patient keynote today. Good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's so exciting to be here today. This is the day that I just look forward to all year long. It's tremendous, like just such incredible positive energy. And um, so I'm looking forward to spending the day with all of you. As, as I felt like it was really an honor this year to have the opportunity to introduce the patient keynote speaker. As Amy said, it was very deliberate from the beginning of MedTech Women that we featured the patient keynote at the start of the day to really set the tone for the day and remind us why pretty much all of us were inspired to go into, into healthcare. So it's, very, um, it's a very special um, presentation. This year, we don't have a patient keynote, we have a caregiver keynote. And um, the stats are such that um, many of us probably all of us in the room at one point will become a caregiver for one of our loved ones. And uh, Regina Holliday is our speaker, and she was put into that position, really thrown into that position. And caregivers often, they don't plan, they don't train for these roles. It just happens. And then there's pretty much heroics that are expected from them as they, as they manage their care through the healthcare system. Regina is a Maryland-based, um, she's a patient advocate, and she's an artist, and you'll see her outside painting throughout the day. Um, she's known for her murals depicting um, the healthcare system and the need for change in healthcare. Um, she, her journey started when her husband became ill um, and later passed away from uh, kidney cancer. Um, she, during the course of his treatment, she was put in a position where she had to manage so many complexities of his care and his decision from you know, access to his, his medical data through to poor treatment and medical errors along the way. And her death, his death then inspired her and was a catalyst for her to, um, to use art as a, as a way of change. Her story is really powerful, so I am just looking for, really looking forward to her sharing it with you. But it also serves as a reminder to us that we really need to focus on the patient and to understand their systems of care more holistically. We're focusing on a global theme today. Um, her story reminds us that even in countries where we have excellent care or excellent technologies, um, Access to these technologies does not guarantee great patient care, and they become really irrelevant um, in the face of this poor care. So I think you know one of the one of the themes there is really that we need to think about um, as we design our technologies, really understanding the systems that these technologies are be being implemented in. Regina has also uh, inspired a global movement called the Walking Gallery of Health, uh, and I know she'll speak to that today, uh, but through w which this Walking Gallery of Health, she's inspired patient advocacy around the world, and she'll share with you some of those patient stories. So without further ado, I it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Regina Holiday. This is the first challenge of a caregiver giving a speech as we rearrange the room a little bit. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm not a podium speaker. Um, I, I want to walk around all the time. This was a challenge for my entire life is I, I, I have to move. I have to be doing things. I, um, even when I was a child in school, I struggled with sitting still. <laughs> my teacher would get very upset with me. Um, she also got upset because I didn't understand reading. So, so she'd say things like A is for apple, and I'd say got it. And if it was Chinese that I was learning, this would have rocked. But it was phonics. And I couldn't understand the concept of phonics. And um, I spent an entire year actually drawing what my teacher was talking about. Because I thought, hey, if I draw it, I will do very well. And, and I would draw. And what my teacher would do is she'd send me to the principal's office. OK? Because um, you're not supposed to draw in school. And when, <laughs> when I would get to the principal's office, he would not be there. So what would happen is the secretary would give me crayons and paper, and I would draw. <laughs> and at the end of my first grade year, I got a sheet of paper that I could not read, but it had pictures of bees buzzing by on it. And um, I took that picture home to my mom. And I said, what does it say? And she says, it says, you'll be back. You're going to repeat first grade. And I was sort of sad. And that year, um, there was too many first graders. It was this bumper crop of children. So they actually put us in an overflow room next to the boiler in the basement. And um, somebody vandalized our class within the two, first two weeks of school. So it was sort of ruined all year. And I had no friends. Everybody moved forward. And they left me behind. And every day, I would go on my playground at school, and I would draw. I would draw swirls and circles. I would draw all these amazing things on a brick wall, and I would use sandstone and shale and natural chalk to draw. And it got me through a very, very hard time in my life. So who are we? My husband was a PhD, a father, an amazing man. <laughs> he focused on film studies. He wrote his dissertation on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> Not a lot of jobs in that field, I got to <laughs> tell you. Um, I, I was a poet and an artist and a retail sales clerk. I was a retail sales clerk. I came to California back in my other life. I came here as a part of a point of sale system users group um, to Palo Alto. And I was in this meeting. And the guy came up to me after and he said, you asked really good questions. Have you thought about getting into technology? And I said, I'm just a, I work at a toy store. I, I, I'm, I'm not a technology person. I don't even have email. I, d I just understand a system and how a system's supposed to work. And he said, well, if you ever think about it, come on back. You could come back to California. And years passed, and um, I worked retail, and I supported my husband as he got a master's degree, he's got a PhD, he worked in film studies. And um, my, we had wonderful children. We had Isaac, and we had Freddie, and our life was rolling on. In 2007, this is our family photo. This was taken at, by Olin Mills Photography at church, OK? <laughs> And it was done at 9 o'clock at night in December, and I worked at a toy store. OK, don't I look amazing? <laughs> and so, so our life was really hard in 2007. In 2007, we were living in Washington, DC. Between my husband and myself, we had six jobs, and we couldn't afford health insurance for our family. So we could pay rent, or we could pay health insurance. We could not do both of those things. He was an adjunct at two universities, as well as a video store clerk. I worked at a retail toy store, and I taught pre-K art, and I taught special ed art. And between all of those jobs, we just could not afford to provide the health care we needed. So what happened? Back in January of 2008, we wrote our New Year's resolutions down. And this was the list. I still have it on a scrap of paper, and it's amazing, because everything happened. See, we wanted Fred to get a job in his field. We wanted our son, Freddie, who had just gotten diagnosed with autism, to get into special needs school. We wanted to spend more time together as a family, because I've got to tell you, working six jobs means you're not spending a lot of time together. And we wanted a two-bedroom apartment, because <laughs> we were a family of four living in a one-bedroom. And that year, God blessed us with answering almost all of our prayers. Fred got hired in American University, which gave us more time together with a family, gave us health insurance. He was so proud of his new job. Our son, Freddie, got into a special needs school named Ivy Mail that would help with his autism. And the only thing we didn't get was that two-bedroom apartment. We thought, hey, this is our year. Things are looking up. Now, the challenge was Fred was working really hard throughout that fall semester and going into that spring semester. And he was hurting all the time. And if you would data mine his status lines backwards. It's amazing. You actually can see five symptoms of kidney cancer on Facebook. But you know, we don't have any logarithm that really watches that and puts it into your medical record. It just sits there, and you don't see the pattern that's forming. So he complained about first rib pain, 
Went to the doctor, went to the ER, they said he'd broken his ribs coughing from a cold, which was odd because he was only 38. Then he started saying he had such horrible back pain. He went to the doctor for the back pain, got on pain meds. By March of 2009, my husband was on four types of painkillers, two types of muscle relaxants, and four types of laxatives, and we had no diagnosis. On March 13th, Fred came home from work, and he was hurting so bad he could barely walk. And it was a Friday night, so you know we're going to get no care. So I said, let's just go to the ER. If we go to the ER, they've got to see you. They've got to find out what's wrong with you. So we went to the pretty ER, the one with the stained glass windows and the coffee shop. And we brought a bag of toys for the kids, and we sat at the couches, and we waited. And we waited for three hours for someone to come out and say, we are too busy tonight. We will not be able to see your husband, but here's some more painkillers, and you should go see your doctor next week. The next week, I went with Fred to his doctor. And I was very frustrated. I'm used to being a mom to my kids. I'm not used to being a mom to my husband. We went in. They just said, oh, can you just go lay down on the table? My husband proceeded to lay down on the table. I said, wait, aren't you going to weigh him? And they said, we don't always weigh our patients. I'm like, really? Because my doctor always weighs me. We have these really long conversations right after. <laughs> you should really weigh your patients, OK? But they said, no, we don't do that. So we get into the room, and the doctor came with a flip chart, and she said, so, Mrs. Holiday, Mr. Holiday, and Mrs. Holiday, do you think maybe, Fred, you're depressed? And we looked at her, and we said, of course he's depressed. He's in excruciating pain all the time. We need something called an MRI. I looked it up online, and there's this thing called an open MRI. My husband's claustrophobic. We need that kind. And we need that kind this week, because we've been coming here for three months, and you haven't figured out what's wrong with him. And she said, I think it's a protuberance of lumbar five. I said, I think it's something wrong with his kidneys. So she found a place that had an MRI. And my husband drove all the way out to only Maryland and then got a CD of his results and drove it all the way back into the doctor's office and left it with her. And she calls us four days later. She says that she looked at the MRI. She would like to make an appointment or for us to make an appointment with an oncologist she knew. Here was the phone number, click. So I didn't even know what an oncologist was. I had to look that up. That is a cancer doctor. And so we had to make the appointment. We went to the hospital on March 25th of 2009. And I went there with my husband. And it was just to get tests initially. And they said, you really need to be admitted to have all these tests. So I got him up to a room, and it got him admitted. And I didn't have all his pain meds, because who carries all the pain meds with a the person? They're like, well, you need to go back and get that. So I had to take a train and a taxi and got back to the apartment and do the exact same thing in reverse to get everything into that room. And then they had more tests. And then I did something you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to leave a patient by themselves in the hospital. But I had two little kids at home, and I needed to go work at the toy store. So I left him in the hospital. And on March 27th, after he'd had tests, my husband called me at the toy store and was crying. He said, Reggie, the doctor was in my room. He says, I have tumors and growth throughout my abdomen. I have a three centimeter tumor in my kidney, and I'm very frightened, and I don't know what's going on. So could you please come here as soon as possible? And I didn't drive. So I asked my boss, says, why could you please drive me to the hospital? Because something's happened with my husband. And she drove me there. And she, she had a whole family of doctors. She said, there's something you need to know. You need to know that you have to write everything down. From now on, you write everything down, because you're the one who's going to be in charge of his care. And when I got to the hospital, I hugged my husband. And I said, I'm going to find out what's going on. And I ran to the nurse's station. And I said, there was a doctor who just talked to my husband and says that he has tumors. And I need to talk to this doctor. And the nurse said, well, he's left town for a medical conference. He'll be gone for the next four days. He wouldn't respond to email or phone calls while I tried to figure out what was going on. When Fred's doctor got back in town later that week, he came to Fred at 7.30 rounds and said, so I understand Mrs. Holiday has been asking questions about your case. And Fred said, yes. He said, yes, with trepidation, because you see he'd worked in food service, and he knows exactly what happens to your hamburger when you complain about it. <laughs> he said, Reggie, I do not want to be that patient. I do not want to be that patient who complains. He said, yes, she's been asking questions. Well, if little Miss A-type personality has questions, she should really come to my office hours to ask them. 
this is a painting of that day. And it's realistic to the day, except for they did give me a chair, but I was emotionally kneeling. They never closed the door, never stopped talking on the phone. That one nurse in pink, she wants to know why someone keeps parking in the wrong parking space. And our ambulance transport in blue, she wants to know whether Mrs. Ke Rosen's chemotherapy suite will be available later today. And between all these interruptions, this doctor, he's talking so fast with words I do not understand. So I say, please, please, could you just slow down? Because I need to research these words online. He said, I don't like people who research online. I said, I'm sorry, but my only way to understand you is to do the research because I don't have a background in medicine. And he said, that's right. I'm the one with a medical degree. So if you look on that wall in the background, what looks like a diploma, what it says is, I have the medical degree. And if you look on the wall over there, there's a portrait of his family, but I don't think it was done by Olin Mills Photography. And if you look in the shadows behind that, in the shadows, there's a picture of our family. Because this was just a moment in the busy workflow of a doctor, but it was the moment that our lives was being broken apart. So people have told me, Reggie, you just had a bad doctor. If you didn't have a bad doctor, you would have no story. There would be nothing we would talk about. I say, oh, no, I only have 45 minutes to talk to you. OK, what else bad things happen? Oh, yeah, how about the MRI? See, in this facility, it's a closed MRI, not an open MRI. And I said, he's very, very claustrophobic. Please, he, if you, let me go in and calm him down. They said, we don't do that. You need to wait out in the hall. He's feverish. Can we see about getting him some kind of Tylenol or something before he goes in? Because it's a long procedure. We don't have thermometers. I run upstairs to oncology and say, can I borrow a thermometer? My husband's down in MRI. They say, we don't loan them out. So I say, can I at least have a wet cloth to put on his forehead? And they did that. And then they double dosed him with Ativan because he was getting nervous. They could do that. They could come downstairs to do that. And then he went in. And I waited in the hall for 15 minutes. And then the tech runs out. He will not calm down. We can't get this procedure done. You need to get in there and get him calmed down. Give me your ring. Give me your watch. OK, I'm getting robbed by the MRI tech. <laughs> so I run in there. I give her the things. I start calming him down. But she didn't ask for the ID. And the minute that chamber came up, it blew right in. Because she didn't ask, do you have anything metal on you? Didn't have the conversation that we need to have. Or how about radiation transport? We were told we could get radiation transport. Well, we could get palliative radiation. We weren't sure what that was. What is palliative radiation? Well, that will help with the bone pain. Oh, yes, anything to help with the bone pain. And then an ambulance crew covered with rain gear comes into our room. We're like, what's going on? They said, we're taking you to radiation. Well, radiation's right downstairs. Oh, no, no, no. This radiation's across town. You have to go on an ambulance. Well, it was the first day at work for one of the techs. So she didn't know on a bed lift, you take the sheet, you do a pull, and you go over. She did shove instead. And what she shoved was a point of metastases. So that was where my husband's hip broke while hospitalized. So all this stuff is going on. I am getting so frustrated. See, I'm a special needs mom. I'm used to IEPs. I'm used to reports. I'm used to reading them. You don't get any of that in the hospital. I'm like, where do we get the information? And they said, there's a special place downstairs called medical records. All you've got to do is go downstairs and ask. And I went down to medical records. And they said, that will be 73 cents per page and a 21-day wait. I said, you're kidding me. This could be hundreds of dollars. He's been here for weeks. And, and it's right there in the computer. All you've got to do is push print. And they said, that's just the way it is. Well, at the same time, my husband was a huge Stephen King fan, OK? The Buffy, all that stuff in his life, really pop culture guy. And, uh, <laughs> That year, Under the Dome was coming out. And if you were a Stephen King fan, you were super excited because that was the book Stephen King lost in a taxi cab back in the late 70s and early 80s. And he had to rewrite the whole book. This was the golden grail of Stephen King books. And it was coming out in the fall. And Fred said to me, Reggie, what if I don't make it to the fall? So I emailed the book buyer at my toy store, who emailed the publisher's rep, who emailed the marketing director, who emailed Stephen King and said, can we get a book from this man who has cancer in Maryland? And Stephen King said, yes. So seven months before publication, we were able to get a book by an A-list author through email. When we couldn't get to the medical record in the facility, we are currently admitted. On April 8th of 2009, my husband and I were in his hospital room. It was a Saturday. And what I did every Saturday was wrap little presents for the children. 
because it's scary to come to a hospital and if there's little presents throughout the room, it's really not so bad. And I was wrapping the presents when the doctor came to the door of the room and he came about as far away as you are right now. He stood in the doorway. He didn't really come in. And we had a list of questions. We had a list of questions like, when are we going to get surgery? And when are we going to get a palliative pain consult? And when's Fred going to get a walker so he can try to walk again? And the doctor said, don't worry about the questions. We've decided we're going to send you home on a PCA pump. And we began to cry. Because we knew enough to know that was code for we're sending you to home hospice. And that's when my husband turned to me and said, Reggie, you go after them. You try to give me some kind of care. So I fought for five days to get my husband transferred to another facility. I was working with a nurse navigator from the insurance company. It was incredibly hard. She was actually crying to me on the phone, offering to take her Ford Explorer, and we would kidnap him, and we would take him to another hospital. <laughs> I said, you know the insurance company is not going to cover that. <laughs> we finally got transferred, and Fred was sent with an out-of-date and incomplete medical record and transfer summary. That meant they could provide no care other than a bed while they tried to recreate his medical record using a phone and a fax machine. He was in excruciating pain. The nurse came to me and said, you know, we can't even feed him because he has no dietary orders, but we won't notice if you go down to the basement to the pizzeria and you get him a slice of pizza. I got to leave finally at midnight when they got him back on his meds. The very next day, Fred's doctors came to me and they said, okay, we want to see your husband's entire medical record from all three weeks in that other facility, all films and CDs, and I laughed in their faces. <laughs> I said, I have been trying to get that information for weeks. They said, well, you're going to get it now. We're sending you back to the first facility as a courier. You're getting it for us. The old hospital printed out Fred's medical record in an hour and a half for the new doctors. And they took it, and they looked at it for a couple hours, and they came over to me and handed it to me, this big ream of paper. And they said, we want you to have this. And I said, wait a second. You said this was important. You said you needed to have this. And they're like, we looked at it. We read what we needed to read. And we have nowhere to put it in our systems. But you, you're going to be with your husband. You're going to take care of him at every facility. You're the one who needs to know this. And I read it, and I was furious. Not because of the medical errors. We all make mistakes. I was furious because of the actionable data that was in Fred's medical record that nobody had acted on. The most glaring was, upon admission on 325, his first test says, patient has a distended bladder. And on 327, and on 328, nurse's progress notes state on 4-3, patient is retaining urine. On the radiology report of 410, which was off-site, because we had to do off-site radiation, I learned about it then. See, that radiologist came to me and literally shook me. Mrs. Holliday. I've been trying to call your hospital. I've been trying to call your doctor. Nobody's returning my calls. Your husband has a dangerously distended bladder to the point of rupture. And it's messing up my imaging results. You need to make sure that he gets a catheter placed when you get back to that hospital. When I go back to the hospital on 410, I run to the nurse's station. I say, okay, I was just the radiologist. She says you need to place a catheter. But I need to let you know my husband has a pre-existing condition. It's called a urinary tract stricture. He's had catheter placed a few times in his life. He's going to need a urologist. And they said, well, we'll try anyway. So they tried with a 16-gauge and were unsuccessful. They tried with a 12-gauge and were unsuccessful. And then they gave up and called a urologist the next day. The progress reports for that day stated, patient refused treatment. So what am I going to do with all this? <laughs> I, I have this medical record, and I, I fought so hard to get it, and you're all in the same situation as I am. So I'm like, OK, I'm an artist. I paint murals. What can I do? I can paint a giant visual mural of my husband's medical chart. So I spammed a 1,000 friends and said, hey, who's got a wall that they can give me? And a local delicatessen called Pumpernickel said, we have a wall, but it's right next to our menu. And I said, OK, it's going to be end stage cancer next to bagels and lox. Are you OK with that? <laughs> and they said, yes. <laughs> See, their mom had gone through exactly the same thing. So I painted this painting, and it was an anatomy chart of a human being, my husband, and it showed color coding for the fact he was incontinent on a PCA pub, soft tissue mets, bone mets. Within seconds, you can see where you should not touch this patient because you could harm him. I talked to the nurse's station about the design of the mural. They're like, this is perfect. If we just had this on top of every medical record, this would help so many lives. And then I put it on this big wall, 
and the very next day, thousands of people saw it. At the same time, I'd already been on Facebook. Facebook was fun. You can plan birthday parties on Facebook. But I hadn't been on this other thing. See, when Fred was sick, I went to work in the toy store three days, and I called them sanity shifts, days where I just got away from the craziness of the hospital. And one of those days, an old customer of mine named Christine Kraft was there. And I said, I must tell you that my husband has kidney cancer. And she went, I just met this amazing man. His name is E. Patient Dave. And he survived stage four kidney cancer. And I said, what? No one survives stage four kidney cancer. I need to meet this E. Patient Dave. And she said, well, you get on Twitter. And I said, what's the Twitter? Well, this was 2009. <laughs> and and I, 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 she said, OK, just go on the computer tonight and figure it out. And that night, with the help of my 10-year-old autistic son, I learned a tweet. And this is my first tweet. I am trying to find Christine Kraft and E. Patient Dave. If you tweet, you know I did that wrong, OK? But E. Patient Dave is so good, he found me with that tweet, OK? <laughs> And then he started tweeting to me. He realized I was Twitter incompetent. And then he started emailing me. And then he called me on the phone and said, oh, you need to talk to my doctor. And by 10 o'clock that night, I was talking to Dave's doctor from Harvard about my husband's kidney cancer. Because Twitter. Thank God for Twitter. And Dave's doctor was really kind because he did something a lot of people don't do. He actually listens. So he listened, and he listened, and he listened. And the only times he interrupted me was for clarification. And once we got to the end, he did a very brave thing. You see, most people don't want to talk about hard things. But Dave's doctor said, you know, sometimes we catch these things too late. Sometimes the best thing you can do is decide how you would like to spend the end of a life. So he went to hospice. And hospice was beautiful, and hospice was kind. And for three weeks, we had the thing called the hospice turnaround, where all of a sudden, where a patient has appropriate pain control, and they are themselves again. They can talk, and they can eat, and they can be with their friends. And we had three weeks of glory. And the hospice nurse came to me and said, so he's stable. We need to see about him going home. <laughs> I said, how are we going home? We have a one-bedroom apartment. It's not even handicap accessible. We have two little children. One is three, and one is a 10-year-old with autism. So how are we going home? She said, well, have you considered moving? <laughs> so we moved to a two-bedroom apartment. That's how we got the final New Year's resolution. And for six days, I was Fred's everything. I was the person who cared for him. I was the person who did his medical reconciliation. I was doing it all. The nurse would hospice nurse would come every other day. She would say, I'm not sure this is working out. I'm like, what? <laughs> she says, well, this is how it works, you know. You, you leave, and then you can come back. Insurance can allow you to come back. I said, you made our family move. And I swore to my husband, we would never make him get up again. We're going to make this work. At 12.30 at night, my husband <laughs> called out on the sixth night, said, Reggie, my catheter blew. And we called the hospice nurse, and she came, and she replaced catheter. She was really good at it. He complimented her a lot for it. She said, well, I worked at the VA for many years. And then she started to sweep our floor. And I said, you don't have to sweep our floor. And she said, you just be with your husband. And here's some atropine drops for when it gets hard for him to breathe. And then something happened. It's called terminal restlessness. And for some families, this is very bad. A person becomes very distraught and tries to get up, but not my husband. See, he always was distraught. And, <laughs> and he was excited and animated. And we talked about Stephen King and Stephen Colbert and our children and our life. And we talked till 5.30 in the morning. And around 6.30, Fred turned to me and was like, Reggie, you look so tired. You should go to sleep. And I did. I said, I am tired. And I laid down for one hour because he was incredibly compliant. We had 7.30 meds. And at 7.30, I got up to get his meds ready, but I couldn't wake him up. So I crushed his pills, and I put them on his tongue, and I gave him the water ball, and I said, all you have to do is suck. And he did. He took his final meds. But the breathing, it got so slow. And then I ran and got my mother-in-law, and I got my children. And we just held his hands and said, we love you, Daddy, and it is OK to go. And then he stopped. We went to a funeral and a memorial service. On Tuesday, which is five days later, I <laughs> began to, 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 to paint a big painting in DC. See, I wanted to paint about the entire problem with Fred's care. 
the lack of coordination, the poor use of technology. I started blogging and Facebooking and tweeting and telling the world about how important it was to make everything interoperable and have appropriate communication. This is the painting 73 cents. It's by a CVS pharmacy on Connecticut Avenue in Washington, DC. It's been now there for seven years and people routinely go to see it. It is my husband's medical care. It is his life story writ large on a wall. It's 17 feet by 70 feet. And it took me about three, hour, three months, three and a half months to finish. Um, a couple of inspirational art pieces for that painting was Guernica and the Death of Marat. And I love this quote. Shouldn't art stick to what it does best, the delivery of pleasure, and forget about being a paintbrush warrior? Or is it when the bombs are dropping, we find out what art is really for? How the story changes things. See, I was an abused child. Back in the 1980s, you didn't talk about it. When I painted the big painting, 73 cents, one of the things I did was Little Girl America in the painting, that's based on me, and her legs are covered with switch welts. And when I was painting this painting, an African-American gentleman came up to me and looked at that and says, the only way you could paint that that realistically is if you lived it. And I said, yes. Because we can talk about this stuff now. And the way we're treating patients in hospitals, not knowing what's going to happen next, medical error, lack of communication, is abuse. So this is a painting of 17 different authors, and they have pens as swords, and they have shields that are their books, and they all wrote a book on how to survive your hospital stay, right? That's what they wrote about. And those books, half of them are still in print, and half of them are no longer in print. You can't get them anymore. And if I wanted to continue that painting, that painting's large. It's about the size of three of these panels, OK? Well, you know what? I could go around this entire room. I could paint this entire room with people who wrote books on the person they lost, the medical error that happened to them, and all of that data is gone. We don't have it. We don't use it, and we do not share it. This is a painting I did about data sets. See, this is George Washington Medical um, University Hospital. It's right down by the metro stop in DC. I painted this painting because the building's beautiful, and it's by a metro stop. That was really important, because I wanted to paint it right in front of the hospital. See, that painting has data in it, and the swirling beautiful sky, I'll actually go back so you can see. That's all clinical scores. They are great on their clinicals. They're giving their pneumonia shots when they're supposed to. They're doing all of that. But that report card this child has in her hands, that has C's, D's, and F's on it based on 2010 data and based on the most le recent LeapFrog report. This hospital, patients give C's, D's, and F's for patient satisfaction, even though it's a large facility in Washington, D.C. And the most recent rating system in D.C., pretty much the majority of the large hospitals got one star. It's not good. This is our nation, our country, and that's our capital, and that is the level of care that we're seeing. So I painted this in front of the facility. It was amazing. People came out of the hospital and kept asking, what are you painting? What is this about? One of the people was really well dressed. It turned out they were on the board of directors for the facility. She asked, how did you get this information? This is our HCAP scores. How did you get this? I said, well, it's freely available on hospital.gov. You can look at it online. In the future, your patients will. I also did this. Um, there was Body Shock the Future, which was a competition of how could you rapidly improve health care in this country. And so I did this painting. And what's happening in this painting is there is a little preschool child with a old-fashioned thermos lunch pail beside a pink toilet, like they had in the 50s. And that child is looking at you in disgust because a preschool child knows you do not eat off a toilet. Yet, this nurse is getting ready to put that feeding tray on this bedside tray table that just did an incontinent bedding change and is not clean between uses. That happens all over the country. And the other problem is, see that kind of table? It's made of a compressed wood and a rubber bumper. There is absolutely no way to disinfect that from C. diff. It's not possible. And you wonder why we're having more and more infections in hospitals. OK, the walking gallery. It's a kind of flash mob, which is spectacular. We organize on social media, and we just show up some places and do not tell them we're coming. <laughs> and occasionally we do. There's, like at, at HIMSS, we, we uh, had like 40 people at HIMSS last year. There are 40,000 people who go to HIMSS, OK? And with 40 people in 40,000, we were sufficient to be in the top 10 of Twitter mentions, OK? 
Images are powerful. They tend to change things. This is a quote of the Shepherd Fairy. I love this quote. It was from um, this wonderful uh, documentary on murals. The more stickers that are out there, the more important it seems. The more important it seems, the more people want to know what it is, the more they ask each other. It gains real power from perceived power. Before I started painting jackets that people wore to medical conferences, that was real estate nobody was using, right? And the patients weren't getting invited. So if we could get the people who went to these medical conferences to wear their family's patient story on their back, all of a sudden, the patient was inside. It's a wonderful guerrilla technique. <laughs> Speaking of guerrilla technique, this is Catherine Costi. She lives in France. She is self-educated. She does all these wonderful mocks on the internet, and she studies genetics. And she's a quirky, wonderful person who's focused on how can she, with what talents and abilities she has, try to improve healthcare. And so this was a jacket about the work that she does. This is Vanessa Carter. She lives in South Africa. She was in a horrible car accident that crushed the front of her head. And so she has had so many surgeries to reconstruct her face. And she talks about facial differences. So she speaks internationally about the power of the face and how important it is to have a face to talk to others and what she's done to try to do that. And if you'll see, her entire face is made out of landmarks from South Africa because your face is a landmark in and of itself. I go to medical events where, um, what well, hospitals, for instance, and I look at their EMR systems and I say, wait a second, I don't see the facial avatar part of the module. You know, you can turn that on. You can have faces on all these medical records. They said, well, we didn't think people would want that. When you look at the human face, your brain function is better. Your ability to understand is better. And your medical errors lessen because you're looking at that person's face as you're treating them. This is a nurse who lives in Pennsylvania. Her name is Mary Jo Shields. And I painted her like children drawing on a sidewalk. You know that whole saying, break, step on a crack, you break your mother's back? Well, her back is pretty much broken. And even though she was a nurse for so many years, she has fought the entire last year to get back surgery. And it just was approved a couple months ago. So she feels betrayed by the system that she lived in for so many years. And that's actually the worst. When you are in the system of care, and then all of a sudden, it turns its back on you. This is Benita Exron. She um, works with iBlueButton. So blue button is this concept that the VA came out with. What if there was a blue button on your medical record that you pushed it, and all of a sudden, you get a data download of all your important data? And so they did it. They did it with a VA data, with TRICARE, with Medicare. But we need third-party companies to use that data, to crunch it, make it understandable. So what she's doing as the woman at the well is she's gathering data. She's pouring into a bucket, and she's making it where other people can drink it. Because raw data without understanding won't help people. But if we can manipulate it and get it to be readable, human readable, we can change things. This jacket was done by, for Kelly, and she has been fighting for not using antibiotics incorrectly for the past 15 years. She sees a major danger on the horizon that we all see now. Even the FDA finally said we shouldn't be putting antibacterial agents in the hand soaps, okay? Because this is the kind of apocalypse that'll occur. So she refuses to give a prescription to somebody who has an effect, you know, like has a disease that will not be treated by antibiotics. Where a lot of her coworkers would just do it. They didn't have the conversation, they didn't have the stress. This is Melanie Prone. She had a wonderful, wonderful boyfriend becoming fiance that had leukemia. And they have the bone transplant, and she got him through that entire procedure. But then a secondary infection hit. And she did so much to try to save him. And he got so thin. And she couldn't save him. He died eventually. And so she created a project called the Butterfly Project, where she can go into hospitals with technology and with music and art and try to make things better. And she even created a little system called Bliss, where people could communicate with butterfly avatars, just so you weren't so alone when you were in the hospital stay. That is her story. This is my son Isaac. He painted that jacket. Um, it, in that jacket, it has uh, two spotlights on two different medical encounters. One he had personally himself about an eye appointment, another about one he had heard about. And he called it feelings, because it's so important for people to tell their story, and that's what he did. In this painting right here, it's about that eye appointment. 
See, those are toys, and they taught you how to be a patient. All those toys are real toys that actually existed. And if you go to a preschool and you see a bunch of kids, and they're all around a chalkboard, and they're pretending, they're playing a game called school. And if you see a bunch of kids and there's a cash register and a shopping cart and fake food, they're playing a game called store. And if you see one child with a stethoscope and the other child seated, they're playing a game and it's called doctor. Only one person owns the relationship. And we're changing that. See, my son went to a clinic appointment where when we got there, they handed him a netbook and said, hey, you can begin typing your medical record. And he was five. Okay, <laughs> and so he started typing his medical record and he didn't get very far because he was a five-year-old. So I started typing with him. We talked about his medical condition. We, we pushed submit. We tried to get the net book back. The receptionist said, oh, no, 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 you, you, you submitted it electronically. I already have it. You can now use that net book to surf the web while you're waiting. And so we did, and then we went to the room with the doctor and the doctor got out his big screen computer and he talked with my son and he says, listen, we can Google your condition. And they started Googling the condition together. And then they looked at the condition, they talked about the treatment plan. And by the end of it, he e-prescribed the prescription and my son jumped off the table and he literally strutted out of the office. He owned this, okay? It was great. And then one month later, we had his regular checkup with his regular doctor, six-year-old appointment. And that doctor turned her back to us and looked at the screen and asked me all the questions and left him on the table. And he started to wiggle, and then he started to jump, and then he jumped off, and he literally walked up to her, stared her in the face, and said, when's it my turn to type? Okay? That's what's the future. This is my oldest son, Freddie. He has an autism. He has an eye and a door crack in the big mural in DC. That's how welcome he felt by the hospital environment. The noises, the smells, the blinking lights, everything was so bad. When he joined the walking gallery, he had me paint this. He said, Mom, I want you to paint a skull on top of the parking lot kiosk in the hospital parking lot, and I want you to put coins falling out the eyes and the mouth because you should not make a family pay to park when they're watching their daddy die. At this point, the walking gallery has been covered by national media multiple times. We've been in the Wall Street Journal, NPR, and Marketplace. When Marketplace called, I said, wait a second. Okay, you do know I don't charge for the paintings. <laughs> the paintings are free. <laughs> you know, this is a movement. We're trying to change the world. It's like a revolution. Uh, so, so what does this have to do with economics? And they said, what you're doing is changing policy. And changing policy affects economics. So at this point, I go to medical conferences. I paint with people. And now I've got other people doing it. That's up in the corner, that's like Gia Riccardi. She was ONC Officer of Consumer Engagement for a number of years. There she's painting at a medical conference. You might not realize this, she has a degree in fine art. Okay? If we use our whole mind, if we bring it all to the table, what amazing things we will do. This is um, a building that I'm turning into art studio where I live, and I, this is I call accessibility. I'm I just put a big ramp in so people can get on our front door. I don't have to do this. The building was built in 1929 by code regulations. I don't have to do anything to make it accessible for people. But I should, because it's the right thing to do. Um, that's a giant sandbox. We built that giant sandbox in an art studio. People were like, OK, this is an art studio for activists to learn how to be advocates and paint about healthcare. What does that have to do with a giant sandbox? I'm like, oh my goodness, if you do not appreciate the wonderful relief of playing in a giant sandbox, you have a problem. <laughs> There's adult-sized swings in there. It lets you center. <laughs> we we want to leave so much behind when we embrace professionalism. And we forget how important it is to connect with just one another on that level. This is an article that was in ePatients Net, and it says Regina is not special. And I love this article. It's my favorite. It's my favorite because I'm not. I was a retail sales clerk that did murals, OK? I'm not special. But I took every single talent and ability that I have and I dedicated it to healthcare. And that's all I ask of everyone else. See, I'm a little Miss A type personality.
Regina, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's, it's, it says on. reminder to us that we all, there, we've made so much progress, but yet there are some areas where we need to do so much better in terms of the delivery of health care. So thank you for that. Um, Regina's going to be with us all day. And some of you may have noticed that outside she set up, just out that door and to the left, she set up um, to paint during the meeting. So we're really excited, you know, it was incredible having her um, share her story with us, but we're also really excited to have her with us the whole day, and she'll be out there painting if you wanna stop by, ask her questions, share your story with her. Um, she, would, she would love to hear that. So uh, thank you again um, for your wonderful talk. Regina steps out, um, I have to profoundly disagree with her on one point because, you know, and my voice is back, by the way. As <laughs> we were here last night, rest assured, I, I'm all right now. Um, so Regina uh, says that she's not special, and I think I'd rephrase that and say that, you know, everybody in our lives, right, we all have capabilities for doing things that are differentiated in some way from others that can make special contributions, uh, you know, versus others. But you know what makes an individual special is that you activate around that and you do it. And so I disagree, you are special. Thank you for being here and we'll talk to you throughout the day.